very good night. Starting tomorrow at 10 o'clock, there's a second chance to see the whole of the highly acclaimed, chilling political thriller, Edge of Darkness. Is it your daughter? Yes, sir, it is. Leave it! I've been working on the assumption that this was a grudge killing. She stepped out in front of the gun, that's what you said last night. Northmore is a nuclear waste plant. Anyone who breaks in there will be met with ultimate force. It's the most dangerous business in Britain. We are interested in anything that goes on at Northmore. That is our brief. Let's be clear about this. You want me to help you, but you won't tell me what all this is about. That's right. I've no intention of putting in the picture. That's the whole of the critically acclaimed series Edge of Darkness, starting tomorrow and continued on Friday and Saturday night on BBC One. Now on one of the last chapter of Frederick Forsyth's History of Men in Battle, Soldiers. has littered the globe with battlefields. This is just one of hundreds in Europe alone. War is one of mankind's universal experiences. It transcends centuries, continents and cultures, and it's a lucky generation that has been able to avoid it. It touches most lives, from the merest contact through a sepia photograph of a long dead relative, to the all-pervading sensations of personal participation. For some, the memory of war is one of unrelieved horror and suffering. But for most, war is recalled as a blend of light and shade, with the warmth of comradeship and shared endeavor set alongside the misery of privation and the shock of battle. On a bright, sunny morning, 1st of July, 1916, the opening day of the Battle of the Somme. The men of the 1st Battalion Newfoundland Regiment were ordered to assault the German trenches across oh, 100 yards of no man's land. They were in the second wave. The first wave had already failed disastrously across most of the front, but such was their eagerness, their innocence, because this was their first taste of battle. But they came out of these trenches without any hesitation and with great bravery. They advanced over this open ground. They walked into what was literally a hail of fire. Machine guns raked their ranks from side to side. Shells burst among them and over them. Men were riddled, sized in two, blown to fragments. Within minutes of an attacking force of 800, 
All 26 officers and 658 men were either killed or wounded. And many other British battalions shared a similar fate on that bright, bloody morning. This was the experience of war at its most devastating, the slaughter or the wounding in a few sunny hours of 60,000 ardent young men. And for those who survived, the memory was like a scar. It was a big mistake that that battle went through. It shouldn't have happened. It was only a slaughter, that's all it was, for so many people to lose their life and gain nothing. There was nothing to gain. We never gained anything by it. The Germans were situated in their trenches, and they were still situated there when we were finished, after we were all wiped out. It was a tragedy, yes, because those people shouldn't have lost their lives, those soldiers. Newfoundland has never ceased to mourn her young men killed on the Somme. But the tragic realities of war were in few people's minds two years before the battle, when the eager volunteers of the Newfoundland Regiment left for Europe in the wild euphoria of 1914. We did have a good send-off. Practically, the, the pier, Irish pier was crowded with people. And after we went on the ship, they come out in boats and surrounded the ship in boats before we sailed. They were saying, cheerio, and God bless you. In the strange world of 1914, when we all got the war fever, all right-minded, lively, active young men wanted to get into it. They did not want to be left out of the great things that were going on. And we, what we were worried about was that the war would be over before they sent us to France. Uh, because some of the old fogies said it'll all be over by Christmas. I was quite frightened that it would be all over by Christmas. I wanted to get there before it was all over. I wanted to be in it. And so did all the lively, active youngsters of my age. Such war fever has marked the beginning of many wars. Thucydides wrote in the 4th century BC. At the beginning of an undertaking, the enthusiasm is always greatest. At that time, both in the Peloponnesus and in Athens, there were great numbers of young men who had never been in a war and were consequently far from unwilling to join in this one. But 1914 remains the most poignant instance of volunteers clamoring, like so many knights errant, to have a tilt at the enemy. All the young people like me thought, right, we'll take them on if that's what they want. One was awfully afraid that we would never get sent out to France in time to get into any real fighting. That's what we wanted at that stage. Uh, we perhaps had slightly different thoughts later on, but uh, in the early days, that was it, the urge to have a go. And the enemy was equally eager for the clash of arms. In the words of Reserve Captain Walter Blum, the whole nation was, in fact, one immense united brotherhood. As I realized the meaning of it all, my heart overflowed with the great joy of fulfillment, with the fullness of living. I was 17 years old, and I got very patriotic, I guess. I would see the soldiers coming through. Uh, I lived in a little town of Vicksburg, Mississippi. And I would see the soldiers coming through, so another boy and I, we decided we would join the service. And we hitchhiked over to Jackson, Mississippi. And he joined the Navy, I joined the Marines. Patriotic enthusiasm and the urge to prove that the new generation is as good as the last one can still produce that timeless, cheerful response to the challenge of war. I remember feeling very enthusiastic about war. My fathers and uncles had gone off to war and defended their country, and I felt very strongly about America. I felt that I was a patriot, and this was the patriotic thing to do. I actually believed that we were stopping the spread of communism.
But the soldier, once committed, has to face the consequences of his action. The uniform and the weapons vary, the cause and the politics change, but every man who marches off to war must cope with the fact, frightening to all but the most fortunate, that he risks life, limb and liberty. The words of a British veteran of the Napoleonic Wars strike a chord today. Why is it that before storming a fort or fighting a battle, men are thoughtful, heavy, restless, weighted down with care? And a young officer about to fight at Passchendaele over a century later confided in his diary, The only thing I'm not certain about is whether or not I may get the wind up and show it. I'm afraid of being afraid. The first time we saw war was in 1915 in the neighborhood of Albert. And it was from there that we heard the sound of battle in the distance. And in the evening, uh, we officers all stood out in the, and we looked and saw a most wonderful display of fireworks going on. Because almost every five rounds or something like that was a tracer bullet and it was absolutely beautiful. Then probably in the middle there would drop a star shell or something, which parachuted down very slowly and lit up the whole of the countryside. It was absolutely marvelous, very beautiful. But otherwise there wasn't much beauty in war. The splendor or the drama of the battlefield may be apparent to the artist, and especially to artists who idealize a nation's heroic moments. But the soldier about to experience the sharp end of war for the first time has quite different perceptions in his mind. On the whole, I think I was not myself afraid of death, but I was mainly afraid of the process of dying and of being wounded. I think that was one side. The other side was um, the fear of disgracing yourself in front of the men whom you were supposed to be leading. I don't think I was ever afraid of death, I was over, but I was always af afraid of being maimed to such an extent that the pain would be such that uh, you couldn't cope with it. I think you get frightened all the time when you fly. What happens is that you train yourself uh, to react to certain situations almost uh, in a robotic manner, so that um, when you are frightened, you go ahead and do what you have to do. You have to be able to fly the aircraft, you have to be able to punch you off the weapon systems whenever you need them. So you get, you get those down pat, and then, so you're a little scared. What happens though, is the more you get into the fight, the less frightened you are. You really don't have time to think about it. Fear is, you, you fear it every day. You didn't know if you were gonna survive it. And just making it through the day was, you know, was, was enough. Uh, you couldn't look forward to going home because there were, you know, it'd be months and then days, and that last day could be the day that you bought it. So you just took a day at a time. And uh, I never looked forward to, you know, like say, oh, I only have nine months left or nine days left. Because I watched too many people do that, ended up never making it home other than a body bag. When men do reach the battlefield, they must face the fact that it's their duty to kill other men. You're searching for the enemy. And the enemy I saw was in a tree directly in front of me. And I fired. And I know I hit the man. What happened to him, I don't know. And it, it was just a, an unusual feeling because uh, really, uh, I've never killed anyone before in my life. But that's the way we were trained. And I'm glad we were trained that way. For the simple reason that I didn't want the enemy coming to our shores. I crawled out to see what the lie of the land was like. I got into a shell hole, and then to my surprise, about 30 yards in front, I saw a German in front of a machine gun combing his hair. I realized that what I must do was to shoot him. So I took my rifle and aimed, and it didn't work. <laughs> so I thought, well, perhaps this has let me off. I crept back. The men had all been watching me from behind, and they were very enthusiastic. And um, they, so someone else gave me another rifle. 
So I, there was nothing for it but me to crawl up again, and there the man was, still combing his hair, and I aimed and shot him. I remember he gave a little cry like a hen squawk, and I came back feeling, realizing in a way that I'd done an awful thing, but they meant that I, obviously it was everyone, all the men were delighted. And so I went back full of triumph to the company commander. The second commander, second in command, deflated me by saying, well, you're in your element now, aren't you? And called me Crippin. And then suddenly, at that moment, something happened inside me. And I, there was a kind of snap. And for me, it was a turning point in my whole war experience. And I felt that uh, fighting would never be quite the same again. When I began at Anzio, war had seemed almost like a game, and like a schoolboy's game, but it was something quite different after that. The first time I killed a man, I was working out of a base camp called Dot Toe up in the Central Highlands. And we went on a patrol, and our patrol got ambushed. So I took two other men, and I went around the flank, which is the side of the, of the, of where, of the people who were ambushing us, to, you know, outflank them and then take them out. Well, we got around to the side, and I pointed my M16 at him, and this person turned around, and I just stared. I froze, because it was a boy. Um, I would say between the ages of 12 and 14. And when he turned at me and looked, and all of a sudden he turned his whole body and pointed his, his automatic weapon at me, I just opened up. And after I you know, fired him the whole 20 rounds into the kid, and he just laid there, I just dropped my weapon and cried. I just couldn't believe that this is the type of what we're going to have to fight. We're going to have to fight kids. And that's exactly what we ended up fighting, was kids. But soldiers are victims, as well as executioners. War may kill them, or the comrades with whom they have trained, marched, and fought. I had this very close friend. We piled out quite a bit in all my experiences in the service, in this outfit. In the States and also in the towns of England, we went dancing and drinking and really having a lovely time together. And we got quite, became quite close. And uh, when we landed, he was, like I said, he was right next to me, within a few feet. And all of a sudden, I turned around, he's down. He was shot like that. And it hurt me so much that I, when I married and had my son, my son was born, I named him Donald Phillip. This boy's name was Donald Phillip Ford. He came from Pennsylvania. And I just loved that boy. For me to lose a friend in, in combat, in battle, is like losing part of my own body. Uh, I personally take it very, very hardly. It takes me many, many months to recover. I probably developed some way of uh, keeping it from being shown outside, but one way I deal with it, I stay in very close relationship with his family and the people that remain after him, and I try to participate in any effort of keeping his name, the stories about him, alive. Of course, it was uh, an appalling thing when you, you might come out of action and another troop had been in action beside you, and you'd learn that somebody you knew had been killed. And uh, it was, of course, like a bullet striking you, but there was also a contrary feeling that it wasn't you. And these two things conflicted. I mean, you know, well, I've survived. That was the first thought. And then that really conflicted with the thought, so-and-so has gone. And it was uh, very difficult to accept that and also to live with these two things together. Battle is at the very center of the experience of war. These guns on a Pennsylvania hillside stand on the site of one of the bloodiest actions of the American Civil War. Pickett's Charge on the last day of the Battle of Gettysburg in July 1863. Advancing up the slope towards the massed forces of the Northern Union Army came 15,000 Confederate soldiers, colors flying, drawn up as if they were on parade. They were less than 200 yards away when the infantry and the gunners opened fire. As the rifle bullets and cannon shot drove into these tightly packed ranks, a moan went up from the field, distinctly heard above the roar of the battle. 
A colonel in the Confederate Army spoke of the fire, shaking his men as if they'd been struck by some unseen power, some great physical force. Soon, virtually none of the attackers could be seen. One eyewitness wrote, the mass of marching men appeared more like a cloud of moving smoke and dust than a column of troops. What happened in that moving cloud, what happens in the middle of any battle, is something beyond description. But if we are to understand war, then we must try to peer into that cloud and make some sense of battle, war's ultimate experience. Men react in many ways to being in battle, from a dazed numbness to an acute, almost sensual excitement, all in the context of the often bewildering conditions of the battlefield. An officer of the Napoleonic Wars wrote, What was passing to the right and left of us, I knew no more than the man in the moon. The smoke confined our vision to a very small compass, so that my battle was restricted to the two adjacent squares of infantry and my own battery of guns. There was a smell in the air of the ammunition that was burning and the shells. I remember it, but it didn't disturb. What disturbed was uh, all this, the smoke that was around. You couldn't see a thing. Even when it was uh, the beginning, beginning of daytime, for us, it wasn't daytime because every second uh, shell that was shot here was of, with you know, smoke, and the smoke didn't disappear in, in immediately. So it was really like fighting inside the cloud, where you don't see, you don't know where you're going. Combat, it's kind of disorganized, you know? It's not like the movies picture it. People are running every which way. Sure, you get your orders and the command. They probably know where you're going, but it's very disorganized. And, and very many things happen that you, you wonder how you ever live through them. And it, it's, it, even with all the training that you had, it, it, it's sheer luck that you would come back. When you're involved in hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, it's similar in a way to a barroom brawl or a street fight or with a gang of men, um, only uh, the stakes are higher. It's his life or your life. I think one felt like a cornered animal, and if you had, you had to uh, kill to prevent yourself being killed. And that was the, the, the main uh, reason why you were there. Once you're out of, uh, off the ground and are running, at that moment, of course, your opponents are firing hard and the people around you, left, right, are the first ones are falling. It's at this point when I think all consciousness ceases to function. You become really like a robot. Uh, and, and you know that if you don't shoot first, it's the other one who's going to shoot at you. Uh, uh, and therefore, the, the, there's really no choice any longer left to you. You behave in the way in which you have been trained. And, and then you start um, the killing. I, I never thought much of anything, only getting into it, getting stuck into it. But, but that's, that's the feeling I always had. Impa feeling of impatience, you know. Want to get it done and get it over. And the same as after, get, get, let me get over and kill some more. That's what I would thought of the latter part. That was all, there was nothing else in my mind. In my case, I found I almost stepped outside of my body and I also found things slowed for me a little bit so I could actually see the problem. It didn't rush and all blur up for me. I was able to see quite clearly and I almost felt I was looking at my own body and the bodies that I was using to to win the battle were pieces that I was going to do. And it was all hot-blooded, yes, but I still felt I, there was a way to, a right way of going about it and, and a, a cheaper way of going about it in lives and that sort of thing. But the enemy against whom the soldier fights is also a human being, a fellow man plunged into the same deadly whirlpool. Soldiers often recognize this common humanity far more than the civilians who cheer them on from the sidelines. One American 
discovered this in Sicily in 1943. I went running and I jumped into a ditch, and lo and behold, in there were about five Germans, maybe four or five of us, and we didn't give any thought whatsoever to fighting. At first, I, I gathered myself together and I thought, well, maybe they were prisoners. And then I realized I had their rifles. We had ours. And then shells were landing and we were uh, cowering against the side of this ditch. Germans were doing the same thing. And uh, then the next thing you know, uh, there was a lull. We took cigarettes out and we passed them around. We were smoking and uh, it's a feeling that I cannot describe, but uh, it was a feeling that this was not the time to be shooting at one another any more than a time when they declare, declare a truce to take away dead bodies. So we were in there maybe an hour and uh, pretty soon uh, it got quiet and we went like that, waved them off and we went our way and they went theirs. And uh, as I think about it now, it seems strange, but at the time it didn't. They were human beings like us. They were just as scared as we were. And I guess they were glad to, that they didn't have to fire. One day on the Somme, in one of the minor operations, I and my company captured a trench, and then we were held up by the Germans, and we lay down in shell holes, and there was a sort of rough fight that went on for some hours. But I was not alone in the shell hole. I found I was sharing it with a young, dead German soldier who was a man about, I could see a man of about my own age and style. And I liked the look of this. He had uh, uh, beautiful white teeth and a fair complexion and an iron cross on his chest, which means that he'd been a good soldier. And I sat with him and I grew fond of him. I loved him. I did not hate him. And two hours later, the word came to us that we had to advance again. And I led my men forward and we went on with the battle. But before we went, I spread a cloth over his face. And I took his iron cross. And I've got the ribbon of it upstairs somewhere now. And it was not like robbing a corpse. It was like taking a souvenir of an old friend. Even on the bitterly fought Eastern Front in World War II, there were a few instances of fraternization. Henry Mettelmann helped two Russians to bury their dead in the Crimea in 1942. I felt a very uh, friendly feeling. There were ordinary people. We shook hands again, and one patted me on my back. And uh, they walked back, and we waved at each other while going back into our foxholes. And um, then I was called out from the back to drive a half-track back to the next uh, field lazarette, as we called it, to bring the wounded back. So I was away for about uh, well, quite a time, more than an hour, I think, and then came back to this hill where the battle was uh, going on. But when I arrived, the battle was over, and I was quite pleased. Everyone was walking around, and I said to my mates, well, uh, what's the position? Uh, finished? And they said, yes, well, Manstein brought in the tanks from the rear, a special tank regiment, I think, Manstein, our field marshal, he rolled the Russian lines up like a carpet, and it's, it's all over now. And um, a strange thing, there were some of my friends were killed, uh, but as a soldier, one gets used to it. But I inquired about the two Russians. I said, those two Russians uh, I talked to, what, what happened to them? Oh, they got killed, they said. Uh, I said, how did it happen? Well, they didn't want to give in. They, uh, we shouted at them to come up with their hands out, and they did not. So one of us went over with the tank, he said, and really got them, silenced them that way. Um, my feeling was um, very sad. Uh, I had uh, met them on a very human basis, on a comradely basis. They called me comrade, and uh, at that moment, strangely as I might, might seem, I was more sad that they had to die in this mad confrontation than my own mates. And I still think sadly about it. War leaves poignant relics on the battlefield. 
It also leaves survivors with the task of disposing of the bodies and sorting out the personal effects of those who have fallen. When you opened their pockets, it didn't matter whether they were Jews or Gentiles, black or white, or French or Poles or Germans, they all had the same kind of content in their pockets. A few uh, coins or uh, a picture of their home, a picture of their children, their wife, their mother, one or two letters, a comb, a watch, and it didn't matter who they were. Those pockets were telling the same story. Yet under the intense pressures of war, men can all too easily become dehumanized. The license to fight and kill can also become a license for atrocity. Above the beach on the cliffs, there was a big 155 millimeter German gun on railroad tracks. Now this gun was just going up and down a beach spraying shells, indirect firing. And there was a German soldier on that beach directing that fire until he was captured. And when he was captured, he was brought down to the beach and he was started to laugh. Ah, Amerikansky, that's exactly what he said. And this MP, may the Lord strike me, that this MP picked up his Tommy gun and started from his crotch and ripped them wide open. Just open them up because he was so mad that this German had the nerve to laugh at the dead Americans that was on that beach. It was, it was one of those things that, what could I say? Uh, it was hell on wheels, I'll tell you that. I remember this battalion of Seaforths in the same brigade. They, they passed through our positions to put in the attack. And uh, a matter of uh, an hour or so later, we went forward to consolidate. They took these positions, and they, they'd suffered appalling casualties. They were lying about like, like uh, dolls. Um, there were a lot of, lot of enemy dead as well, but there were a great number of these Seaforth Highlanders. And I, I think I was probably more shocked by, by this uh, incident and by anything else uh, uh, during the war. A lot of our people went round the corpses taking their watches and rings and actually looting their own, own dead. Men do become hardened. Uh, there was one instance in the 1st Battalion of our regiment in which two army officers arrived, swaggering, uh, contemptu contemptuous of us uh, and arrogant and approached the front and asked you know, where they could get a good view of the action. And there was a sergeant there and he said, you just turn right around that corner. He turned right around that corner and immediately both of them turned right around the corner and both of them were dead. And that was deliberate. I found it to be a dehumanizing experience at the time. Life became very cheap. We booby-trapped bodies, we burned people's houses, we searched their houses. We'd go into a village and go into someone's house, and there'd be women and children there, and begin searching their houses. I knew very little Vietnamese. I knew Didi, which meant get out of here, and a couple of other small words. La Dai was their, Cancun was their uh, identification card. All the people had identification cards. It was all in Vietnamese. The only thing you could read on it was their date of birth, uh, and most of them were looked 20 years older than they actually were, and they had pictures on them. But I can remember watching women coming into the village, heavily burdened with their, their products. And we didn't have to stop everybody, but we'd, we'd always pick the woman who was most burdened with goods and stop her and make her put it all down and show us her ID card. And then when she did, pick it all up and go. Everybody thought that was pretty funny, that, you know, that we could do this. And you had this power over people. And you could go into their houses and search their houses. Think about that in this country. We pride ourselves on democracy, and we have uh, a constitution that prohibits illegal search and seizure. And here we are doing it. We would go into a house and pick through their personal belongings and looking for weapons, looking for whatever it is we were looking for. And if we suspected this was a hostile village, torching the house. Well, the movies make war out, like, um very glamorous, you know, it's the thing to do, you know, give your life for your country. 
I'm for defending the country, you know, and patriotic that way. But war is not glamorous. Uh, all these young kids who want to go to war and kill all these different people don't realize that their chances of getting killed are just as great as they're killing somebody else. And when you have all these bullets and, and bombs flying, going all off around you, you wished you were anywhere else but war. Uh, if, so, if everybody could be in war just one day, just one day in, in war, and see the reality of it, uh, I think that would change a lot of attitudes towards war. You'd be less likely to, uh, to be involved because it's the, the, the soldiers, the NCOs and the lower soldiers who all have to do all the fighting. It's not the generals. I mean, you know, they sit back in these air-conditioned rooms and say, well, I think we ought to take this hill. We're taking this hill, you know, you might lose three or four hundred men. They don't see that. I mean, if they were to see that every day and see what uh, a bomb can do to somebody or what a bullet can do, or watch your best friend die in your arms and there's nothing you can do about it, it would change a lot of attitudes. Some Second World War U.S. Marines, recovering in hospital from wounds received in the Pacific, found the difference between real war and its Hollywood image more than they could stomach. Each evening, we would be carried on litters into the theater, and we would see a movie. That night, they had a treat for us. Before the movie, John Wayne stepped out on the stage in person wearing a cowboy outfit, chaps, boots, spurs, two guns, a trekkered shirt, bandana, a Stetson, and he waved his hand and he said, hiya, guys. Utter silence. Then someone started to boo. And then we all booed. And we wouldn't let him talk, and eventually he left. Why did we do it? Because to us, John Wayne was a symbol of the machismo myth, the machismo which had led us to join the Marines in the first place. And we knew it now to be a naked fraud. And here was one of the confidence men. And at that moment, we hated him more than we hated any Japanese soldier. War exhilarates, but it also exhausts. Fighting spirit is not a commodity in unlimited supply. And the longer the war, the greater the strain on even the bravest and most professional of soldiers. Lawrence of Arabia said somewhere that, uh, that every man has so much courage. I mean, some people have more than others, obviously. Uh, but you, you can't draw on it indefinitely. It's like money in the bank was the analogy that he drew. Uh, you, you can draw so, so much, but sooner or later it's going to run out. And I did find that, that, that um, the, the uh, unit I was in, the 51st Highland Division, we'd been in the, in the desert from Alamein right the way up to Tunis and then to Sicily, and they brought us back to do the, the Normandy invasion. And the, there was a sergeant, for instance, in my company who was uh, a, a, a very courageous soldier. He got the MM. That doesn't mean all that much. They come up with the rations, as they say, but you know, they don't give them to cowards anyway. And uh, he'd had enough. He really went to pieces and, and was hysterical and terrified. And uh, in fact, the MO sent him back. My brother-in-law was in, in Vietnam, and he was a lieutenant in an infantry unit. His close friend was a sergeant. And they were being hit so bad and everybody wanted to get out of there, that the sergeant just couldn't take it anymore, took his gun and killed himself. My brother-in-law, in turn, had to write the letter to his, his parents. And he started to write it that, you know, your son was in Vietnam, he served very well, you know, and then committed suicide because he couldn't take it, couldn't be here, and didn't want to be here anymore. Uh, the captain refused to let that letter go out. The letter went out that he died in combat as a hero which is, you know, fine in some sense. You know, why let the parents know that? But my brother-in-law has had such a guilt complex over that for these 17, 17 years since it happened. And he still feels that he should have told them. And it's just eaten him up so bad that he won't, doesn't want to talk about Vietnam at all. But war is not one long act of combat. 
It has its lighter moments, enriched and made memorable by comradeship and a special brand of humor. There was one memorable story of a gunnery sergeant who was briefing his men on Saipan, and he said it's foul jungle, and there's quicksand, and there are snakes, and disease-bearing bugs, and and a uh, private popped up and said, well, Sarge, that's true, why don't we just let the Japanese keep it? Humor was extremely important, and it, uh, it all, was all based on comradeship. Of course, there were one or two characters around. I, I had a friend called Charles Newton, who was absolutely bubbling over with jokes and so on. And I remember we heard Germans rattling around, and he shouted out uh, in German, uh, da, uh, wir können nicht schlafen, shut up, we can't sleep. And that we all laughed. And then I had another friend who had went through a most fearful time, and I said to him, um, uh, how did you manage to survive? And his answer was VET 69, because he had a bottle of VET 69 in the bottle. And there were always sort of little jokes going on the whole time, and you just couldn't survive without joking, really. A spark of amazingly cheerful humor flickered even among the trenches of the First World War. A British subaltern wrote, there never was a more cheerful, philosophical, kindly creature than the British soldier. His humour is inimitable and equal to any emergency. One of these chaps put a notice outside his dugout, My Ob Villa, um, M-Y-O-B-B, -B, My Ob Villa. And uh, eventually the Brigadier came along and he said, well, what's that mean, My Ob Villa? And, Chap said, well, sir, I don't think I, I better not, I wouldn't like to tell you, sir. Go on, you tell me. What does it mean, my odd? Well, it means, mind your own bloody business. On the Kokoda Trail in New Guinea, uh, the Australians were passing, would, it would pass a place where there was a, there was a body, this happened often in World War I, there was a body buried except that an arm, a hand was sticking out. And as the Aussies would go by, they would shake the hand and move on. That's the kind of grisly black humor that people really don't understand. And after every battle, there is the next dawn. When there has been a particular heavy bombardment and suddenly it all stopped, the whole forefield and behind you, in front of you, was full of bird song. And you couldn't imagine where those birds had come from, whether they had survived this kind of uh, 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 onslaught or whether they had suddenly flown into uh, this area. But there it was, and it was so overwhelming, and the contrast was so big that, uh, and, and the effect of it was so terrific that you forgot the, the experiences of the night very, very quickly. Um, and the first sunshine, the warmth of that sunshine, the, the, the song of the birds, the fact that you were still alive in one piece, you know, gave you great hope for another day. But battles and campaigns and wars end, bringing for those who have come through an unforgettable sense of survival, no matter how small the war. And for those on the winning side, there is the special exhilaration of victory. The moment of victory is very difficult to put your finger on. And sometimes you think that's it, and it's not it. So it's very elusive. I think throughout the night of the battle, I thought it had happened a couple of times, but it hadn't, because they'd think of another dirty trick or something, or when we'd actually gained all the objectives, they started shelling us and we started taking casualties again and that didn't look like victory to me. But uh, perhaps the next day, when for the, some reason the Falklands weather's like that, it was a beautiful sunny day and those of us who were all okay were together on another piece of ground with the, what was left of a cup of tea just being thankful that we'd actually made it to another dawn. And I think that moment when it was warming your back, the sun, and you were sort of smiling at each other, I think that probably was the moment of victory, real victory for us. The human agony of war does not end when the last shots echo into silence. Individuals and societies have to cope with the consequences of war, 
just as they met the demands of fighting it. And this is a place where the memories of war are particularly raw and immediate. It's the memorial to the dead and missing of Vietnam in Washington. Here, Americans come to remember those who perished or disappeared half a world away and only a few years ago in a conflict which split the nation. The creation of this monument has, in a curious way, healed some of the wounds left by Vietnam and has helped America come to terms with its own collective experience of that prolonged and bitter struggle. When I first came down here, it was a very, very emotional experience for me. I started walking down, looking at the names, and I had to stop. It took me at least another month before I was able to come down here and actually see the entire memorial without breaking down, without having very emotional feelings. Uh, I can handle it very well now. I come down quite often. I look at names that I know. I, I have a tendency, if I know somebody, I, I run my finger across his name to give me that feeling that, hey, I remember you and, and we were together, that type of thing. And uh, I now, I, I think it's a fine memorial. I think it's, a, it, it's, a, it's something that Vietnamese veterans can be very, very proud of. There can be no doubting war's essential horror, but the experience of war links fighting men across history and sets them apart. An officer of the Second World War observed, the veteran has compassion for the civilians hurt, the soldiers slain, even the enemy soldiers. But having survived a hundred perils, he would not have things other than they were. For he thinks better of himself for his campaigning days. However regrettable it may be, there are still a great many men in this world who feel quite different from the common run of mortals because they have been under fire. It is as though it were some sort of hallmark. I wouldn't say I'd volunteer for it again, but we were young, and that makes a lot of difference. You know, you, if you've seen anybody now, whether inside hanging out, it would turn you up a lot. But then, it was just part of the business. And there were nobody, as I know of, has ever grumbled about it when we were up to the knees in mud and water. You know, they, I'm just a bit to themselves, but not a, not a real grumble. I would say that Vietnam were good years of my life. Uh, they were... They taxed my abilities to the fullest. They got me an opportunity to see and experience things in life that I never uh, would have experienced and, and really have never experienced since. It's a unique experience that I'll never forget. It is totally degrading. And, but it also, and there's an uplifting side, it is true, and in the comradeship and the sheer comradeship. And, and it's a wonderful thing, sort of, uh, being with other people, fighting together, pulling together, and I'm sure the people um, in London during the Blitz felt exactly the same. In some respects, it, it dehumanized me at the time, but in a lot of respects, it, it, it humanized me. I now, uh, I live each day more fully. I enjoy my children, I enjoy my family, I enjoy a lot of things that I might not have enjoyed. And they say that about people who survive disasters, always have the trauma of the disaster, but they live each day much more fully. And I think that's true about me. It was a harrowing experience. It's something that, in fact, this afternoon when I rode here in a cab, the cab driver said to me, it looks like we might have World War III. And I said, for God's sake, don't even talk about something like that. I said, because that would be the worst thing in the world. I said, having the experience and lived through a uh, World War II, oh, no more.
and by any standards.